Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are here with our final Cabral house call of the weekend, answering all of your questions each and every Saturday and Sunday. Hopefully, you're tuning in same day as it releases live. I try to keep the shows to about 20 minutes, all shows on the Cabral concept, so that you're able to tune in on a daily basis, if possible, to continue to increase your knowledge of natural health. And that goes for all natural health fields. I'm a huge fan of Every single one of them, whether it be acupuncture or yoga or good nutrition or Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine or uh, good quality chiropractic care, of course, naturopathic care, functional medicine, lab testing, you name it, there's a time and a place for each one of them. That is absolutely what I learned uh, after doing uh, health-based internships all over the world, uh, you name it, I was there and uh, really got to learn that all of these practices can work. You just need to make sure that you're getting quality-based information from the right practitioner that's able to set up this particular plan for you. So with that said, we're going to go over your wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions right now. And again, we're about six weeks behind. Uh, this show is being published on Let's see here. It's episode 1871. So if you want to read along with the questions, you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1871. And it's on up, but being published March 21st. So we are seven weeks behind because this was, uh, this was sent in on February 1st. Okay. So, and again, we're only behind because lots of questions come in. And so the queue continues to pile up and pile up. All right. First question of the day is from Anonymous. They are writing in, Hi, Dr. Brawl. I've been following you for many years. Nice seeing you on YouTube now. Appreciate your heart in doing what you can to help others heal. Since November of 2020, our 12-year-old son has had burning issues when he pees. And more recently, he has had some mild cramping in his bladder area. Urinary tract infection tests have come back negative. Our DO tested for yeast on the tip of his penis, so we have been treating that with Sovereign Silver Gel that has shown some improvement. Yeast was detected in his urine, though we later realized it might have been cross-contaminated. We put him on Diflucan for 20 days, the first med he's been on in 10 years, as his DO said herbals wouldn't be effective in that area. He's very healthy. Unfortunately, not a whole lot has changed with the burning cramping. He has an oat test a few years ago that showed he had yeast overgrowth and oxalates. We did do the kid's CBO at that time, but unfortunately, weren't able to do a finish with the sealer or do the right probiotic for him. He had a reaction. Any thoughts? Have you seen similar cases? Is there a factor that I possibly haven't even considered? Appreciate any insight you may have from your years of experience. Thank you. Anonymous, happy to help. This is why we do what we do. So, um, yes, I have seen this before. Um, it can be from multiple things. So let's go through them. It can be from yeast. Okay. It can be from actually acidity, the urine being too acidic as well, which can cause bladder and kidney issues. Now this isn't common, but some people aren't as good as at buffering the pH of their blood, or they have more acids in the blood and they're able to then excrete those, which they should be from the kidneys into the bladder, uh, out through the urethra of the body, and you get some of that burning. So it's not as likely that that's the scenario. The more likely scenario is we have some bacteria, we have some yeast, and that we need to make sure that we rid this from the body. I would personally rerun that candida metabolic and vitamins test, also known as the organic acids test. I would do it definitely with Equal Life so that you get one of our um, certified health coaches overseeing it. I would probably do that children's CBO, and I would use the, uh, they're going to recommend you some citra, drop, citra drops. Just ask them about citra drops, and they'll help you with that. If you don't want to do the lab, I would just do a consultation then uh, with one of the health coaches. I can't give you a treatment protocol. I can't diagnose disease over this podcast, that's for sure. So, um, and then again, um, if the clean gut probiotic didn't work, interesting. Again, you need to work with a health coach on this so they can go back and forth with you. You might want to just use acidophilus, uh, which has been real, shown to be really great for eliminating a lot of yeast as well. So that's where I would start. Uh, what else can I give you? Coconut oil could also work on the tip of your son's uh, penis as well instead of the sovereign silver gel. Uh, 
I wish I had more information, you know, as to what I could help with here. I understand what you're going through, and I would certainly try that. You may even try the healthy urinary tract protocol, which I would. Um, that would be uh, the D manos, the. Uh, you can use apple cider vinegar, vitamin C, which is ascorbic acid, not the alkalizing vitamin C. And what is that one other product? It is the citrusetal drops, but as a 12-year-old, uh, you'll use the citra drops, okay? So again, uh, you can look all of those things up for the health coaching, for the urinary tract, uh, for the children's CBO, all at equi.life, equa.life. All right. Josie's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I got the vaccine for COVID a little over a month ago and have been struggling with dizziness, weakness in my legs and arms, a tingling sensation, as well as burning feeling in my back and, and muscle spasms. I'm really scared that the vaccine has triggered an autoimmune reaction. I have Hashimoto's and I've been pretty stable before due to diet and working with a naturopath to find the underlying root cause. I did not get the second vaccine and don't plan to. Is there anything I can do to recover from this? I'm really scared that I did permanent damage. Thank you so much for your guidance. Okay, Josie, so of course I can't say whether it happened because of that or didn't happen because of that because again, I can't diagnose uh, disease. What, what we do know is that obviously by taking the vaccine, we are uh, increasing the immune systems. Uh, we're stimulating the immune system to then go after a particular uh, virus that looks like, we'll say, COVID. So what we want to do is right now is we want to, let's say, calm any type of exaggerated immune response. So our job would to really be doing that, I've got a copy right here, of course, of course, of the rain barrel effect. We really want to be following that de-stress protocol now more than ever. So the anti-inflammatory diet, the gentle exercise and walking, the stress reduction, the functional medicine detox, the, and we are doing our community detox April 5th, so hopefully you join us for that. Again, not a treatment protocol, I have to say that. And then uh, getting your rest, extra rest right now. Working on that emotional balance, doing the supplement protocol, such as balance supplements like the Daily Foundation Protocol Level 2. And then, of course, success mindset that you will overcome this as well. So that's where I would start. Sauna is always great. Uh, all, again, be gentle with the body. Calm the inflammation from every area that you can find it. Breathe, meditate, relax, and, and get that immune system back functioning well. Georgine is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I've been listening to your podcast every day, read your book, and I'm going to enroll in IHP soon. Thank you for everything you do. You are truly amazing and a gift from God. Well, thank you, Georgina. I appreciate that. That's, that's probably the highest compliment that I could get. So, and I'm glad that you're going to be entering IHP. We, we'd love to have, have you, of course. Um, you know, it's such an amazing community. It really is. And so hopefully you are uh, one of those 100 in March. That would be great. You are the only option I trust, so I would like to know your thoughts on TRS, if you've heard of it. If not, what are your thoughts on water-based nano zeolites or zeolite in general for removing heavy metals? All the best, Georgina. Well, Georgina, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to find you the episode, just because you gave such a nice compliment, where exactly I talk all about zeolite, zeolites, and TRS. All right, so you just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, and literally, we're just going to type in zeolite, Z-E-O-L-I-T-E, -E, and I'm going to give you the episode numbers. Usually, I ask you to do this, but again, such a nice compliment. I have to help. All right, 1401 is an episode on zeolites. 1318 on the TRS spray, so specific to you. 1143 on zeolites. 1129 and 779. Let me repeat those going backwards. 779, 1129, 1143, 1318, 1401. All on zeolites. All right, Georgina, there you go. And um, 
I don't even want to kind of sum it up because I really go in depth there. I talk about it, how I do like them, but I would definitely not use them as my only way for removing heavy metals. It would definitely not be the only way. I would use the heavy metal protocol that we o- offer it over at Equal Life. It's backed by science um, and clinically proven to remove 90 plus percent of certain heavy metals from the body. And you could add zeolite if you'd like. Like we have zeolite inside of our intestinal um, cleanse. Okay. Emily's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I really admire and appreciate you sharing your rich knowledge. You have taught me so much, and as, as a result, my life and the members of my family lives have dramatically improved, and for that, I'm truly grateful. It's great to hear, Emily. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I'm wondering if you have any idea of why my three-year-old daughter smells like craft glue after she sleeps. She does sweat a lot while she sleeps, and I do believe it is her sweat that is smelling that way. She does complain of stomach pains after eating gluten. She also got eczema during the summer holidays after getting out of our eating routine and having a lot more... uh, Icy poles and baby chinos. I have no idea what those are, but it says they contain cow's milk more regularly. We are getting back into our regular routine again and getting my daughter's eating habits back in order, cutting down out dairy, cutting out dairy and sugar. I'm thinking she's sensitive to gluten because she chooses not to eat it much of it and complains about her stomach pains. She suffered in the past. Would really appreciate any suggestions on my daughter's health. Okay, happy to help here. So you know, the, the smelling like glue could certainly be a detoxed issue, her body getting that out uh, through sweating as a child. I remember when my daughter, youngest daughter, uh, who sweat a lot as a child, uh, we found out she had H. pylori. And uh, we certainly cleared that up, and she did so much better with less uh, sweating as well because kids' detox capacity and ability to clear that is, is not as great as adults. But I'll tell you this. I can't recommend enough the... Uh, Candida metabolic and vitamins test for your daughter, as well as the IgG food sensitivity test. One is a urine test. The other is just a prick of the finger. I've done them both with both my daughters, and I got great results out of doing those. If you wanted to add one more, it's a stool test, uh, but that would look at bacteria. And, And so what I recommend, run those labs first. Because you might have to do the children's CBO protocol besides just an elimination diet. And that test will give you the answer as to whether that is the case or not. Okay? So that's what I would do. Like, hands down, that's what I would do. So, yes, you wrote in on 28. I know this is uh, 321, but that's what I would do. I would run those labs, and then I would begin the plan that you get from the health coach. Nothing wrong with eliminating the gluten, the dairy, and the sugar. That's great. But I would run those labs to see if there's a reaction. And then, of course, you could have a little gluten and dairy the couple days before you run the food sensitivity test as a challenge to see if the body reacts to it. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. And you'll figure this out. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. You'll figure it out. All right, Darren is up next. Good day, Dr. Brawl. I appreciate the info you and your guests bring to us. However, I don't know if somewhere along the way I got confused, but with regard to the topic of breathing, it seems like specialists Dr. Belisa, Patrick McEwen, Brian McKenzie, and James Nestor all have different views on the topic. If that's the case, and I'm not actually confused, I get that's normal. I would just like to know, aside from the breathing exercises they recommend, what exactly is the ideal way to breathe in your everyday, normal life? I believe you recommend exhales longer than inhales and nasal breaths. But should it be deep or shallow, as some recommend, or is there ever a need for mouth exhalations outside of heavy activity? I hope my question isn't all over the place. Thank you. Darren, it's a great question. And believe it or not, believe it or not, they are all saying the same thing. And I want to I want to phrase that a little bit better. So, Doctor, um, by the way, you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts. Scroll through the top, click on conversations with Cabral, or just use that little yellow button on the side, and that will take you to all of my interviews. So, all of these people are breathing specialists: Doctor Belisa, Patrick McCoon, Brian McKenzie, James Nestor. Okay. So. What do they all recommend? I always like to look for similarities. So this is what I do. This is what I do in, in my integrated practice. I've studied, again, all over the world and, and um, because I was skeptical. And I wanted to say, hey, who's really telling the truth? Well, what I found is there are just wild similarities, if you really look, that say, hey, do this, do this, do this. And that's what I try to teach you. 
So, and part of that's the subtractive process that I've spoken about, talk about it, excuse me, in the rain barrel effect. Okay, let's get to the crux of this because I want to answer your question. Every single one of these experts recommend nasal breathing across the board. So that is that. Then they all recommend typically a uh, shorter breath in than the exhale so that you stay more parasympathetic nervous system dominant. They all recommend diaphragmatic breathing, breathing to the lower lobes of the lungs and exhaling, uh, sorry, uh, inhaling so that the ribs and everything starts to spread out and you start more near the belly and then it comes up to the chest. They don't, they, none of them recommend chest breathing. And the differences then lie in more of the shallow or deep breathing. But that is not, I don't think that the, any one of them would disagree that there are benefits to deep breathing as well. So I actually think that there are tremendous benefits to deep breathing, tremendous benefits of being able to circulate the blood to a greater degree, uh, increase dopamine in those people that need it, increase alertness, uh, oxygenate, uh, well, it's not going to technically oxygenate the tissues right away, uh, but it could uh, for the minutes to hours after that. Uh, it can improve breath all the time. So, but for the majority of the time, the low and slow breathing is the way to go. Now, can you breathe outside of your mouth, exhale out of your mouth? You can. And I don't think that that matters as much as breathing in through the nose. Breathing in through the nose or breathing in should always be done through the, through the nose. Except when you can't get enough air in, such as in sprinting or some really high anaerobic threshold activity. So again, I see much more similarities than, than dissimilarities. And uh, James Nestor and I actually talked quite about this, uh, quite a bit about this, and same with Brian McKenzie, of the different variations. Like I really believe in like in yoga, the lion's breath and dog's breathing and like the, the different styles of breathing for different things. We touched on it. I don't know if you caught this. If you listen to the show all the time, doc, uh, not doctor, um, yoga girl, Rachel Brayton actually talked about exhaling out through the mouth to try to release a lot of negative energy as well. And, and I like that because that's actually part of yoga as well. So again, it's not an all for one regular everyday breathing when you're sitting at your desk in through the nose, out through the nose best way to do it, but you can go in through the nose, out through the mouth if you need to. All right, Darren, great question. Next question is from Darren. Hey, Dr. Rawl, Darren again. On the same topic of breathing, I read the reasons why many are always breathing more heavily from one nostril than the other is a natural part of our nasal cycle so that each nostril operates effectively. In order to open one side of your nose and close the other, your body inflates tissue with blood in the same way that a man gets an erection, except in your nose, increased blood flow causes congestion in one nostril for about three to six hours before switching to the other side. The process also gives each side of your nose a break since a constant stream of heavy Heavily flowing air can dry out and kill the small hairs that protect you from foreign, foreign, from foreign contaminants. Is there any truth to this at all? Okay. Some truth to this, yes. But not to a big degree. Meaning like, it's not perceptible to most people. Let me, let me take a step back. When we talk about congestion, you'd be like... If you breathe in, you wouldn't be able, you'd hear that the nasal passages are having difficulty getting air in. It's not like that. One nasal passage may stay more open while one stays a little bit more closed. In uh, Ayurvedic-based medicine and yoga-based breathing, and yoga is a branch of Ayurveda, you'll notice that each side of the nostrils deals with the parasympathetic or the sympathetic. And by doing alternate nostril breathing, you can actually create more balance in the autonomic nervous system, which controls sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, and parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest, relax, digest. So that's why alternate nostril breathing can be so fantastic, which helps to re-regulate that. You can just do that for about five minutes and you'll, you'll be good to go. Um, I've done shows in alternate nostril breathing. Of course, you can just look up alternate nostril breathing on YouTube and you'll find plenty of videos. So it's not exaggerated. Like This is true to a degree and your body will help to shift that, uh, but almost imperceptible, almost imperceptible. You're not going to feel like you have a, a stuffed up nose. Okay. Darren's up next. 
Dr. Brawl, final question. Oh, another Darren question. All right. Uh, you listed the importance of dry brushing in your book. I'm a tad embarrassed to say I find the diagram a bit confusing. And there's conflicting views on techniques where some say brush towards the heart, others say toward the lymph nodes or extremities. To quell all that, is it possible to do a video demonstrating exactly how dry brushing should be performed? I think I will put doing it on hold out of fear I may be doing more harm than good, as always. Thank you. All right. So, Darren, two things. Uh, always great to ask these questions. Always great to ask the questions. There literally are no bad questions. Like, you need the information. Okay. Bunch of things. I show you exactly how to dry brush inside of IHP. So if Darren, you seem like an inquisitive person who wants to learn more about health, I would check out the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute. So go to ihp.coach or the other same URL is just integrativehealthpractitioner.org. They'll take you to the same place. Okay. So with dry brushing, I've done many podcasts on it. So I would also go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts so that you can get uh, a in-depth view of how to complete dry brushing. But I'll give you a synopsis overall. You both want to always brush towards your heart and always brush to your lymph nodes. So they are both correct. So typically, I start with my legs. And I go from kneecap to groin three times in each spot. Just lightly. You're only depressing about one to three millimeters. And you go around the whole upper thigh. That moves the lymph before you then go to the lower leg. And you do the same thing on the lower leg around your leg. So three, three, and you just go all around the leg. And then you do the full leg from ankle up to the groin to move all that lymph because there are nodes behind your kneecap and also in the groin. You do it on both legs. Next, you can go from wrist to armpit. Not as much fluid to move there, all right? Where are the lymph nodes? They're in your armpit right here, right? Then you can also take your fingers and go from uh, jawline to collarbone. There are lymph nodes near the collarbone. You can do the stomach in a circle if you like, and the uh, lower back can go down towards the hips. The stomach can go in a circle. I've, I've said that before. But all of these move towards the heart. Ankles to the groin is moving towards the heart and the lymph nodes. Wrist to the armpit is moving towards the heart. And all of it basically is moving to this left side of the chest and then out of the body. So, uh, Darren, hopefully that answers your question. I think that uh, you'll be able to find, again, many more podcasts on dry brushing. And, of course, as always, um, anyone is invited to learn more about overall integrative health, if this interests you, this topic, at ihp.coach. Take care, everyone. That is our show for today. I'll be back tomorrow with our first Mindset and Motivation Monday podcast of the week. 